Fisher, whose very first film earned her a Best New Director nomination at the Goya Awards. She has gone on to win four Goyas for her work as a director and a screenwriter. In 2009, she was awarded the Spanish Ministry's Ministry of Culture's Gold Medal for Fine Arts. You will meet her in just a moment, but first, I am pleased to introduce our interviewer. The Spain and Portugal correspondent for the International Herald Tribune, the global edition of the New York Times, has covered political and social issues, sports and culture, and recently wrote a piece on Spain's contemporary arts institutions, including the Niemeyer Center. Please join me in welcoming Rafael Minder and our very special guest, Isabel Coixet. Y otra vez, buenas tardes. Yo soy Gwyn Philbrook de The New York Times y estoy encantada de darles la bienvenida a todos ustedes aquí en la cúpula y por todo el mundo a través del web. Estamos encantados de colaborar con el Centro Niemeyer para presentar este fin de semana de la cultura aquí en Avilés, la primera vez que se celebra en Europa. Nuestra invitada de hoy es una cineasta premiada cuya película le valió una nominación al mejor nuevo director para los premios Goya. Ha llegado a ganar cuatro Goyas por su trabajo como directora y guionista. En 2009 fue galardonada por el Ministerio Español de Cultura con la Medalla de Oro de las Bellas Artes. La conocerán en un momento, pero en primer lugar, me complace presentar a nuestro presentador. Él es corresponsal de España y Portugal para The International Herald Tribune, la edición global de The New York Times. Ha escrito sobre temas sociales, deportivos y culturales, incluyendo una visión reciente sobre instituciones de las artes de España, entre ellas el Centro Niemeyer. Por favor, demos la bienvenida a Rafael Minder y nuestra invitada especial, Isabel Coixat. Welcome everyone, thank you very much for coming to the Niemeyer Center and it's a real pleasure to have uh, the opportunity to interview Isabel Poichet here and I suggest we start perhaps with a very short uh, uh, roundup of a video that uh, will remind us of some of the very great works that she's produced, uh, direct, uh, that she's directed over the years. Thank you. This is you. Hope there's someone who take care of me. Eyes closed out in the rain. You never thought you'd be doing something like this. Hope there's someone who set my heart free. Nice to hold when I'm tired. There's a ghost on the Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. How can I fall asleep and I, I will not raise my hand? Oh, I'm scared of the middle place between life. What am I gonna do now? In no way. Can I ask you how it happened? Sans cesser de pleurer, elle sortit des papiers de son sac à main et les lui tendit. Hey, my buddy Penny. I'm not gonna be at your birthday party, but there's nothing I'd like more in the whole wide world. Cariño mío, siento que esta enfermedad maldita que no se ve 
que va por dentro y un día te mata, nos va haciendo a los que somos pobres más y más invisibles y a nadie le preocupa lo que nos pase. When I think of all the things I used to think were so important, all the arguments I got into with my mom, so stupid, all the time I wasted. Oh, I love you with the kind of love that I used to wish for as a teenager. And now I wish I would never have again. Cuando eres un niño, nadie te dice que el amor pueda ser tan... Devastador. Sí. I'm in love with you. And the world seems less terrible because you exist. I don't think that's going to be possible. Why not? I'm afraid that uh, one day I may begin to cry and cry so very much that nothing or nobody can stop me. And the tears will fill the room and I won't be able to breathe, and I will pull you down with me, and we'll both drown. I'll learn how to swim, Hannah. Oh. I think that's it. Shake them lazy bones, read the t-shirt but still don't understand Coming home with a little apocalypse, it comes now Do you have time for this? A three-tone carpet and a Jackie Chan spear Looking at a Hindu and a belly full of beer Well, I ain't no poet, ain't got no rhyme But I got me a car and I know how to drive In the event of pressure Well, that, that, that was great. <laughs> But it's beautifully cut. It's great. Yes. Great. I, you've had a very atypical career in many ways. You didn't go to film school. You knew you wanted to make movies. You had a grandmother who worked at the box office of a, yes. a Barcelona movie theater. Uh, then you got into an advertising company. You worked as a copywriter. And then you had an early breakthrough. You had the chance to make a movie. Yep. That went wrong. And uh, then you spent eight years in advertising. So w what exactly went wrong? I mean, was it that it completely uh, took the, went out of your sales? W why did you um, do that? Uh, when I did my, my first movie, I was, I was really young. It was a time where uh, in Spain, it was really easy to make the first film. Uh, it was a law. It was, I think it was the last year of the Miro law, Pilar Miro was a, a very good filmmaker and a, a pioneer for all of us in, in lots of senses. And, um, and you know what? I always dreamed about being a filmmaker, about making movies. But I guess when I did my first film, I was more in love of the idea of being a director than actually making movies and telling stories. And, and the film, I think it was really pretentious and kind of empty. I think it was well done. And there were some nice touches, but I remember once in, in Tailorite, I met Gus Van Sun, and, and we were talking about first films, and, and I, I said, yeah, but you were lucky because your first film was Mala Noche, was really good. And, and he said, no, my first, my, first, my, my first film was a Mala Noche, it was another one, but it burned the negative. So, you know, sometimes it's good to begin with, with a failure. Um, I think directors who begin making like a really good movie, they have then, then they have a really bad time. They, you know, they have to, their expectations are too high. 
my expectations weren't too high. <laughs> but after that, it's, it took eight years for you to, yes. to, get, to get back to making a movie. I mean, that's a long, long time to cope, digest failure. <laughs> yeah, that was a little too much, I know. Um, I was, I don't know, I was devastated. I was really depressed for a time. I spent one year, I never went to the movie theater. I never, I, I didn't even watch TV. Um, I, I, submerged my, I, I put myself in working and in learning and uh, I work a lot. I work in, in lots of commercials. One year I did 80 commercials. Oh. I work in Australia, I work in the States, I work in Argentina, in Germany, in Turkey. I even I did a commercial in Ukraine. Uh, I learn. I work with very good directors of photography. I work with Ed Lackman, who had the Oscar for from, Far From Heaven. I work with uh, Vittorio Storaro. I work with Escoffier, who, who died um, uh, uh, 10 years ago, like two months after we were doing a commercial from a heart attack. And I learned a lot from these people who are very talented. And, and I try to I tried to get as much as skills, technical skills, as I could. Uh, because I think technical skills are important, then you have to forget them, but it's, it's good to have them. And it's good. I learned to operate the camera, who was very important to me. And you, you want, you're in fact one of the few directors operating the camera. I mean, yeah. is, is, that, is that some, what does that skill bring? I mean, what's the difference between you and people who are behind a monitor um, and directing from, from a distance, you think? Well, every director has their own path. There are people who are very comfortable just working with the actors and then going to the monitor. There are people who work very close to their DOP. Uh, I work very close to my DOP. I, my last films were made with a French DP called uh, Jean-Claude Larieux, who is the most amazing human being. And, and I think a uh, truly underrated artist, but that's another story. Um, I think when you are operating the camera, is as my films are always, they have a layer of intimacy. I think it's very good to be close to the actors and, 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 and you can follow their movements, you can breathe with them. And I think if you're operating the camera as a director and talking to the actors, and being with them in the same space, that really, you know, I think that captures something. Who if you're, a, maybe it's just a superstition, I don't know. But maybe it captures something. Who's there at the moment, there's some, some heat, some, I don't know, some electricity between the actors. And, and I want to be there with them to capture. And, and in my experience, all the actors, and I work with very good actors, all of them, they really were comfortable with me operating the camera. I mean, uh, there are other directors like Soderbergh. I think he does it too. Uh, but you know, it's 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 a cho it's a choice. It's easier for me. And also, I mean, you know, you're there from the script all the way through. You're doing the cutting. Are you a bit of a control freak? I mean, is it is this part of the story that you want to me? No. <laughs> <laughs> that you want to keep really? This has to be exactly the way you've, you've uh, imagined it. I think, I think it, I'm kind of lazy. So it's easier for me, you know? If I have to, learn, to waste energy and time explaining to someone else what I want, uh, it's too much work. I'd rather do it myself. Um, actually, one thing I, 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 I never did, and I, I think I want to do it, is, is catering for a film. <laughs> right. Yeah, because... We need more, you know, we, we need better caterers. <laughs> better scripts too, but caterers are really important. And what, what kind of food can, can people expect on, on that? Um, we had really good food when we were doing uh, uh, the Tokyo film, uh, Map of the Sons of Tokyo. We had really, really good food. Uh, sometimes it was too good. We failed you. <laughs> so, you know, too tired to work. Um, but you know, in Spain, uh, or in San Francisco, Life of Words, it's a film who happened in an oil rig in Ireland, but all the, all the studio part who was like 
five weeks. We built the, um, the sets in, in Madrid. And, and I remember every time at 11, you know, in Spain at 11, you have to cut for el bocadillo. Rosa. That's a tradition. Rosa. And uh, and I remember Jim Robbins the first two days was like, why are we cutting at 11 for the bocadillo? The third day, I say, okay, we're not going to cut. And he was like, I need my bocadillo, <laughs> please, right. right now. And in fact, your, your, your own uh, production company is called Wasabi. So we are yeah. heavily into the uh, food and also the Japan the Japan theme. I mean, you have a clearly very strong interest in Japan. I know you did recently uh, yeah. a photo exhibition uh, to show solidarity and to raise funds for the nuclear yeah. disaster there. Uh, what is it? What is it in that um, attracted you, attracted you so much to to Japan? The first time I came to Japan, I you know was a tourist. It was uh, 18 years ago. I had in my mind all this you know, Mishima and Yasunari Kababata and Ozu Films and, uh, and Richie Sakamoto, Buto Dance, all these things. Uh, and I was a little, I remember being a little disappointed. The Japan I created in my mind wasn't there. But, you know, a little by little, I, I came back several times and I, I realized something. In the first trips, every time people were like, you know, I was like, why, why, why did you do that the whole time? No, it was. I took it as a, as a way of distance, as a way of okay. There's a lot of respect, but not a real communication. And then, little by little, I began to see this this Bowen thing as a, as a way to create a, 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 a road to the other, a way to to be close to the other. And then when when I began to see this Bowen thing as a, not as a distance, you know, if a, as a link between people, I, I really began to fall in love with Japan, and, and I am, and I feel very, you know, very at home there. I, lots of filmmakers have talked about how difficult it is, and for me it was really easy. I think if you, probably because I, you know, I'm very used to work with different crews, with different systems, and I'm, you know, you let me in Iceland, and I can make a film there. I know, uh, but I, I really like, I really like the delicacy. I think there is nothing more beautiful than when you are in a kaiseki restaurant of traditional food, and you have these amazing waitresses, and the way they just pull their sleeves to serve you sake or tea. I, I'm just in love with this little gesture. And for me, this gesture captures something very difficult to explain with words and very and specifically Japanese. And you've also um, got this um, ability, I think, to break barriers uh, with different cultures. I mean, you're, you're the least uh, Spanish or even least <laughs> Catalan of, of the major directors. Uh, you've, you, as you say, you've basically made um, uh, the world your home. And it's interesting, I, in the uh, map of the sounds of Tokyo, you have a great little dialogue in which yeah. the main protagonist says, there's all this ridiculous business of differences between Japan and the rest of the world, but men are jerks wherever they are. <laughs> Did <laughs> I say that? He says that. He uh, says that to, he says that. Because I think, you know, it's true. I, you know, we spend so much energy and time saying how Americans and Spanish were different, how Catalans and and people from Andalusia were different, and you know, there are much more things who make us close and who are the same than differences. And I, you know, I focus on the things we have in common. And, and I, well, you know, probably it's, it's a lot to say, but I think if people will focus on the things we have in common, we'll, you know, maybe the world will be a better place, maybe. And you have also um, basically managed to um, bring in uh, very different actors uh, to work together from yeah. from different different cultures. Is is this sort of part of that project of uh, of as well? I mean, you have some I, very interesting matchups. You know, Ben Kingsley, Penelope Cruz. I mean, all sorts of uh, unlikely matchups. I think I'm very very lucky because I had the chance to work with very extremely talented people, and not just you know, you know, this DOP I was talking to you. Um, Musicians. I work with Anthony and the Johnsons two times in my films, and and he's a good friend of mine. Um, 
and I learned a lot from him and, and, and from Jean-Claude Larrier, my director of photography, and with all the actors I, I work. And, and for me, it was, oops. I think we're still good, we're still good, yeah. Era una cebra, pero le han puesto esto, no sé por qué. Bueno, en fin. Um, for me, the chance to work with Ben Kingsley and Tim Robbins and, and Dennis Hopper. I remember Dennis. I remember the last day he worked with us in, in LG. Uh, it was the scene of, her, of his death, and, and, and he was so, so upset, so upset. And I remember him taking my hand and saying, Isabel, I don't like this death scene. Can you do, you know, can you cut the scene? It's like, no, Danny, you have to die. And, and two years after, he, he actually died. In but he was a happy man, you know? He was, he was living, I think, the last years of his life, not probably with when he was sick, but he was happy at the time we were doing Elegy. He was really happy and really, really um, glad of, you know, working with Penelope and Ben, and, and, and he was remarkable in Elegy. You, you've done, I think, one of the most powerful films about death, uh, My Life Without Me. This is unbelievable film. And uh, I was interested to find out that basically you took a, a, a story, a Louisiana story, and you changed two things about the story. Yeah. First of all, that the, uh, the girl in the original version, she, when she dies, she turns to Jesus. Yeah. And the second thing, and again, that's what, what, you, what you said, you said you cut out all this bullshit about having to share your feelings. This American bullshit about having to share your feelings. Did I say that? You, you did. You did. I, I mean, at least. At did, le I said American bullshit. You, no, uh, I, I was drunk. Uh, you probably were drunk, me. but 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 <laughs> but black on white. That's that's what I read. No, I. I mean, I remember. I remember. For me, uh, my life without me was was a film when when it opened in Europe. It was very, very extremely well received. When it opened in Japan, it was it was a success. It was really a, a big, big success in, in Japan. But then with Sony Classics, we, we went to America, we went to the States, and we had this 20 cities tour when you start in Telluride and you go to, you go to Washington, you go to Boston, you go to Chicago. We, you, I went you know, everywhere, Minneapolis, St. Paul, what, I mean, everywhere. And every time in the audience, there were like a, a bunch of people saying, but why she doesn't share her, her feelings? And why she doesn't find Jesus? And why is no God in your film? I remember in one in Dallas, it was, it was very heavy because probably I'm naive, but I never thought about God in relationship with this film. Well, I don't think about God normally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> My daughter, when she was three, she said something remarkable. It's not because I'm her mom, I think, I think it's remarkable. She said, Mom, God is impossible. And, and I said, yeah, that's exactly how, how, how I, yeah, it's impossible. But, um, I think sharing is good. I think probably if I was going to die and I know yeah, I have like three months of life, I would share this thing. At the same time, there is a part of me who says, why? Why I have to... Sharing this thing is a very selfish thing. It's, I was, uh, uh, for me, it was the reading of the, this not sharing was exactly the opposite of people in the States. Those questions were never raised you know, in Argentina or Japan or in, or in Australia because I traveled with this film all around the world. And in the States, it was the only country where people were very angry, even angry. I remember... <laughs> One, uh, when we were in the, um, uh, this foreign press thing you do in LA, you know. Wrestling. Yeah. It's very weird, this, this, this foreign press thing. <laughs> Someday someone has to explain it because, okay, okay that's another story. Um, I remember people were really like offended by the film. So, but you know, it's, it's good also to, to realize you do something. You are in your room writing, you do a film, you convince people to, to be with you in this process, and then suddenly someone thinks you're, you're a creep because you did a film with a woman who wants 
to have sex with someone else, even if she's in love with her husband and, and someone who never, not once, thinks about God. But, you know. You, you have quite a few um, women who, in your, in your movies, who have a very, very dark uh, or difficult secret to keep. Uh, reuse uh, a contract killer, um, and then we've got um, obviously the, the secret uh, of the rape yeah. in Yugoslavia and the secret life of words. Uh, you Angelina Jolie is doing a film Sorry? too. Angelina is doing a film about I Well, that's the, we'll look forward to a that one. A little late, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but we look forward to, But you say a little late, but you also say that uh, you, in, the, in the movie you say that you want to keep alive the memory. And you, you have this great um, phrase where, where she says, 10 years after the Yugoslavia war, the only people who remember are those who are too ashamed to have survived, which is very uh, powerful. The shame of survivors is something who has always, always uh, struck me. I remember reading Primo Levi when I was, when, when I was in, in, in college. And and the shame he explains about, you know, people, the survivors of the Holocaust was a concept I, for me, was very difficult to understand because I, since my father is someone really obsessed about, you know, the Second World War and Holocaust, and he took us to, to the town to see how it was, we, we, me and my brother, we were raised in this awareness of, of the Holocaust. And, and I had this very naive idea when, you know, all the survivors came out, they would be received with, you know, an orchestra and a band and, and prizes or something. And no, that wasn't the case. And, and I think when, when the Yugoslavia war was over, almost over, um, I, never, I never understood why there was no, first of all, no justice, because I think for victims it's very, it's key to see the people who have you know, rape them and, and, and murder their families, being a trial, I think that's, that's key. But there is no, you know, no, you know, nothing. Just some, some organizations are like the one in the film, IRCT, mm -hmm. which is a real organization, International Rehabilitation Center for Tortured Victims. That was the, the, one of the few organizations really listening what the victims were saying. Mm -hmm. And... And the film for me was a way to, to say, you know, uh, there's a lot of suffering under, you know, the people who are around us working in our factories and cleaning our toilets. And, and you, you spent a lot of time researching this film because I, I read that you interviewed 85 w women survivors of, of, yeah, but of, I did of that, rapes yeah, before. I did a documentary right. before. Before the film, I did a documentary in Sarajevo about about survivors, okay. about the... Um, and th this, gave you, this gave you the, the platform to, to, to go on to make a feature movie about it? When I finished the documentary, I mean, the last thing I wanted to do was, you know, talk or, or explain or show some, you know, people who had been raped or tortured. That was the last thing. But, you know, once I began to write the story in the oil rig, this Hannah's character was, who at the beginning of, of the idea I had for the script was just, you know, a little touch at the end, this character began to grow. And, and, as, and you know, I learned uh, when a character is imposing herself in the story and, and you keep thinking about it, I, I learned to, you know, okay, if this is important and this is, you know, getting to the plot and, and interfering with the other characters, then, then there is something here and I have to explore it. But, but believe me, the last thing I wanted after spending one month in Sarajevo was talk about anything who had to do with this work. But you've managed in your career to do this switching from documentary to drama and now you, you've even done last year, again, a, a big uh, ad that was the major major hit uh, for, for a beer, co beer company here. Yeah. Is it difficult to change the mindset uh, or are you basically at ease um, because you've, you've been doing everything for mm -hmm. so long, it doesn't really matter what, what kind of um, uh, shape um, you're using to, to get your idea I'm, across? I'm a big fan of documentaries. I don't think I did. I, st I still have to do a really good documentary. 
you know. Um, I think I use documentaries as a way to explore things I'm curious. I was, you know, since the first time I read an article in the New York Times about the RLC, 20 years ago maybe, I had this obsession about the RLC. And I did a documentary in Uzbekistan about how when a sea, like the RLC disappears, what happened with the, you know, the people around, the villages, the food, the allergies, and I, I was really curious. And, and I think it's, you know, it's a very simple documentary who shows what happened. And, and, uh, and Ben Kingsley did the voiceover. He, he was, you know, very involved with this Uzbekistan and, 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 and the ecological disaster. Um, but I, I don't think it's a great documentary. For me, a great documentary is, let's say, um, Capturing the Fritmans. And that shows the work of someone who spent, you know, two years or three really getting into the life of people. The things I've done as documentaries are, I think, are okay, but they are not, they are not great. Well, your, your last work is, is a documentary uh, about Balthazar Garçon. Sí. And uh, it, it was premiered at the Berlin Festival. Yeah. It got good reviews um, outside Spain. And then, <laughs> uh, from what I've seen, it got bad reviews in Spain. Yeah. And I mean, how do you, how do you deal with that? I mean, what, what no, does that show? we knew it, we knew it, and Baltasar knew it, and I knew it, and, but you know, those things, that's, they don't have to stop you to, to do what you think you have to do. I mean, uh, I really believe, I, I, I said it uh, several times, but I never, I never met Garzón before. I'm not a fan of Garzón. I just, you know, I'm a citizen just reading the press every day and listening some TV channels and some radio stations who are trashing him in a very, really, really nasty and, 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 and terrible way. And, and my only, you know, I really want to, to hear what he had to say. How was he feeling? I mean, a guy who really was so devoted to, to justice, how? how he was feeling being in the trial and, and all these accusations was really, they don't have sense and they don't make sense for me. And I think in general they don't make sense, but you know, I just convince him to, to talk about what he thinks of this or what's happening here. And also for, you know, I think Baltasar Garzón is, it's an example of what happened in this country when you really are excellent in what you do and when, and when the spotlight is on you. I mean, we, we really, you know, it's something I'm not saying it. I mean, it's in, it's in Cervantes, it's in Lope de Vega, in Calderón de la Barca, in all our great authors, envy is something always behind, well, in Shakespeare too, I mean, behind the terrible plots of this, classical novels. And, and I don't know, I saw Garzón in, in Costa Rica three weeks ago. He's working in Colombia. He was doing a, a talk in, 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 in Costa Rica and everybody treated him like a hero. Everybody, I mean, it was, it was a really social uh, thing and it was in all the TVs and all the papers talking about human rights in, in South America, no? And, and he will not be a judge here. And I think we, we need more people like him in all levels, in politics, in, in, in industry, in investigation. We need people who are passionate about what they do. They do mistakes, yeah, of course. That's, we're human, that's what we do. You, do you find yourself under pressure? I mean, you come from a part of the country, Catalonia, that is trying to uh, gain a lot more independence or at least autonomy, you're, but you're not really flying the flag. Um, no. And uh, are you un under pressure uh, as a result of uh, no, the fact I'm that a... you could be a great ambassador uh, but, but are not playing that role? Mm, ambassador in Paris. That would be, <laughs> that would be glamorous. <laughs> I would like that. You know, I, I think I'm a very practical person. I don't feel any pressure. Uh, well, in any case, it's not... The fact, well, I'm probably I'm not the most favorite person of the Catalan authorities, but you know, it's. I always try to speak my mind. I have a, 
the last seven years I have a column in a, in a paper in Barcelona. I say every time what I want to say. If people like it, great. If not, you know, well, it's, it's what it is. Um, if I was, you know, if I would really convince if we are independent in Catalonia, things will go better and we'll be happier, I will not have any problem. I don't feel, I'm not a Catalan nationalist, but I'm not a Spanish nationalist, not even European. I think, as, as you said before, I think there are jerks in every country and, uh, and, and they are very good people in every country. So, um, I don't want to say this thing. A professor I had, uh, a Scottish guy, was I would say, I, it's an expression I really hate. The world is my oyster. I hate that because I hate oysters. <laughs> uh, pearls too, I think pearls are bad luck. Um, but thing, I th really think things can be much easier. And we don't have to waste so much time talking about flags and national aims and, and, and languages. You know, my mother is from Salamanca. My father is Catalan. I, in my home, I speak Spanish with my mother and Catalan with my father. And I think it's, it's a blessing because I, you know, my grandfather was French. I speak French too. Uh, my first boyfriend was American. I speak American. Uh, I have a Japanese boyfriend. I'm trying to learn Japanese. Good luck. You know, <laughs> I know <laughs> it's difficult. Yeah, it's a tough one. I'm. I don't want to sound new agey or naive, but really, I mean, we have better things to take care. Uh, now in in Catalonia, we have this thing about the kids have to spend more hours uh, learning Catalan than than Spanish. Well. Uh, I think Spanish is a, it's a, it's a great language and it's very useful. So, you know, let's be useful. What's most useful for our kids? Let's do that. That's what I think. And as you must know, since you live in Spain, I mean, this is a country where people doesn't speak English. They don't. Well, it's they improving. It's care. improving. It's improving. Slow, but, but come surely. on. Yeah. Yeah. Especially now. I mean, we're living from tourists, so we better, you know, rush up and learn fast. <laughs> Well, or even Chinese or Russian. Russians are coming too, you know? They're, 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 they're already here, I think, in the south, I a know. few of them. I've seen a few. But you've, you've, got, you've basically now also um, taken the step of going into Hollywood with Elegy. I mean, what, what are you, where are you going to be next? Um, I mean, I, I asked you earlier before we, we, we came on stage, you know, how many, whether you're working on, on some things, you said, oh, a few, and then you listed like four. So, I mean, <laughs> How, how do you cope with, with sort of choosing where to focus your energy? Um, uh, I listen, really, I listen to my heart. I, uh, I read lots of scripts, and the things who really stuck in my mind, the ones who I really feel move or touch, or the ones I feel I have a point of view on the construction, those are the ones I choose. And, and I think I'm lucky because I'm getting really good, really good stories. And, and, and one of the things who make me happy every day, I'm not a happy person, but I have some... Well, you, you seem know. to be quite happy. No, no, no. no. Oh, I'm okay. melancholic. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know me yet. No. <laughs> True. Um, it's, you know, the world is full of stories. Uh, not just for feature films, for for documentaries, for, for little documentaries, for, oops. That's a zebra. Uh, for, you know, two minute stories. You can, you can do things with your iPhone. And I'm doing things with my iPhone. I just did one last week for, for a person who's going to, to Harvard to talk. And, and she asked me, do something, do a portrait of me. I can, I can show before my talk. And I did it with my iPhone. And, and it looks great. And what I want to do is just tell, you know, keep telling stories. That's, that's all. You're going to be telling probably a very difficult story for, for HBO, for production about yeah. an, an it's a incest um, story. It's an incest story. Um, it's a big taboo. What, yeah. what, what, what's a, what made that uh, script uh, stand out? 
because when they tell you the story, you're like a brother and a sister in our days having five kids or seven or you say, but what happened? How these people, I mean, there are millions of people in the world. You have to have kids with your brother. And then you read the story, uh, you find out who these people were. And, and the fact I began with a distance, the fact I began saying, come on, what? Brother and sister, you, you have better things to do than make kids. But then you read the story and you understand these people. And, you, and the fact I want, I want share, you see, sharing this American bullshit. Uh, <laughs> uh, the fact I want to share what, what I found about these people who are, it's deeply human, no? the wish to belong, the, the, the fact they were, they were raised in foster families, they never met until they were, uh, the guy was 30 and the girl was 20 something. The fact they found each other in, 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 the middle of, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a strange no man's land, it's, it's a really, really powerful love story. And, and the brother is actually in jail now. The brother is in jail, yeah. Did you in interview him? No. 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 I, hopefully, I, I will have the chance to talk to them. I really want to. It's, it's you know, it's, it's becoming an obsession now. And has it left you with the feeling that he shouldn't actually be in, in jail? I don't think he has to be in jail at all. I don't think he's a criminal. And as strange as, as it can be, and uh, I don't think you have to forbid a brother and sister who never share anything to, to, to be married at all. And you're also going to do a, a project in Italy which yeah. is going to be uh, about uh, the Saviano book, yeah. the Saviano book. I mean, and there again, it's a, it's, par it's a difficult situation because it's going to be, if I understand right, trying to show why there is empathy for organized crime in, in Italy. Yeah, and I think, I think Roberto has lots of things to say. And I, first of all, is someone I really admire. I think, uh, I think Italy needs more people than Roberto Saviano and less people than Berlusconi and, and all his team. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's so, so unfair. He's, you know, he has to live undercover. He cannot, you know, he can have a free life just, just not because of, not just because of Gomorra, because all the things he's saying, not outside Italy, in the places where the Gomorra has the most power, and, and uh, there was this program, it, it, it was this mission he did in Italy called uh, like the Paolo Conte song, uh, Viene Villa Con Me, who is, I think is one of the most powerful two hours of television I've ever seen. I mean, this is a guy talking with a deep knowledge of what he's saying about the history in Italy, the th history of uh, economics in his country, uh, the, you know, the little daily life things he's seeing in, in Naples, in all the area. And, and I, I really admire him. I think he's a very good writer, an amazing journalist. And, and I hope we do this, this, this project very soon. You've also turned down some, some major scripts. Um, <laughs> we were talking about that earlier. You turned down the script for Million Dollar Baby, which went on to be, you know, yep. major award-winning Clint Eastwood movie. Yeah. It was a script I really love because right. it had all the elements I love. Come on. Yeah, no, it's but powerful. the script at the time, one of the things that happen is sometimes you get that script, who's good, but all the people, actors, attach. You read the script, you see the actors attach, and it's like, it cannot be. At least you, I, don't, I, I, I didn't see it. I mean, uh, at the time, there was another actress attached to play... Um, who who uh, was that? Uh, Sandra Bullock, well, mm. I think it was, I mean, she said it once, I yeah. think, so I, I guess it's not, I mean, I hope we'll, a jet of lawyers will not fly to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. To me. Um, and I, and, and she was, she wanted also being the, the executive producer of right. the project, and 
for me, it was very, very difficult to, to see her as this character, really. I, I couldn't. Um, and then, of course, Clint Eastwood came into the project and said, no, 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 uh, I want someone else, I want Hilary Swank, and, and the producer said yes, and that's why I want to be Clint Eastwood when I grow up, <laughs> even now. <laughs> yeah. I think it's very useful. As I told it's you, useful. I'm, I'm a very handy person. Let's, let's be practical here. Right. So, so, but is it the case that you've uh, had a lot of interference from producers and so on that, that has actually been the deciding factor in refusing or some projects? Mm. Is that how it works, that basically the project might be great, but the setup, the f framework is just uh, not what you want? Um. Doing making LED, I learned something. I learned, I was really like all European directors because you know, you hear the stories, you talk with Wim Menders and he's telling you how his life was a mess when he was working here and all the problems he has. And you know, you hear stories and we have this taboo of, about Hollywood. But I learned something probably because when I, when I went there, I was a grown up, I wasn't a, you know, I wasn't a kid doing the first movie. I learned you can stand for good thing. I mean, what they can do. I mean, one of the things was, there was this sentence I always love about, who Orson Welles said about the, um, uh, the McCarthy era. Uh, the, the American leftists, they, they betray their ideals uh, because they love their swimming pools. I love this, this, this thing. You know, I, that's not the case in our times. What they can do to you if you don't do what the producer said? Nothing. They can put you in jail? Well, that will be great because, you know, in Europe you will be a hero, so <laughs> that's a positive part. You, you know, the producers, they have to say what they think, what yeah. they want. They have to make clear what kind of project we're working in and what kind of film they want. And then, if they interfere in your work, well, you have to stand up and say, you know, maybe you see it that way, I see it that way, I'm behind the camera, that's what I want to do. And I, under, I, I, found out, I found out, if you say that, they don't put you in jail. They don't put you yeah. in jail. But do, do, but do they cut the financing and, and tell you to go home? Is that, can that happen? Uh, yeah, but I have to say in my experience uh, in Elegy, it was my only experience like in a, in a studio. Who was, it's a studio run by, by two people who I think very talented, uh, Tom Rosenberg and Gary Lucchesi. Uh, well, you know, we spend some weeks at the beginning of the film. We have disagreements. And, and I said, well, maybe I'm not the director you need. Maybe, uh, you know, there is someone else there. But I will not, you know, I will not, leave, I will not run away. But I offer you, if, if what I'm doing is not what you think has to be, you can call someone else. I'll be here until someone else replaces me. I don't want you to lose money or anything. And, and nothing happened. No, I keep, I keep working. And I, I have to say, I didn't, have, I didn't have final cut. But they respect what I did in the editing. And I was editing myself. And, and, and I, you know, I respect them a lot. And they respect me a lot. And they, you know, you can... You, I know, you know, all these legends about this, this Weinstein guy. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it's one or the other because I, I confused that. Pretty much. The one who's married with a very glamorous designer. Well, I'm going to get it wrong. Bruce. I mean, all these things and how they call him Edward Caesar Hands yeah. and all that. That was, I didn't. You've I never had that? Never, never. And you've been able no. to. If, to even if. I had that, like someone saying, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that. I say, no, over my dead body. But and you've, you've, I mean, how do you see now the situation here in Europe? Because you've, your productions have, have been financed in part by, um, yep. by public money. I mean, you're not uh, flying the flag for Catalonia, but the Generalitat, the mm -hmm. regional government, has helped finance. Uh, that will end, yeah. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing. nothing. And, and basically, now we're in a major you know, crisis here. There's no money for anything. What, wh how, what impact is that going to have on, on movie making, in, in, let's say, in this part of the world, but in general, you think? Uh, my films are being financed by public televisions, TV3 and, and Televisión Española, not directly with, with public money. 
in, in any case, I didn't touch that. I, right. Because I, I'm not the producer of my films. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to say, probably against all the filmmakers in Europe, I, I think in this moment we have priorities who are really, really much more relevant and important than movies. I mean, I don't want, I, I don't want cats in, 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 in public hospitals. I don't want cats in, in schools. I, if, if they have to cat something, okay. And, and, and you know what, I think even if, if, even if there is no public money for movies, keep, people will keep making movies, you know? There is a, there is a way to, to finance things. There's a way to do things cheaper and of course, we will not we will not be able to do cowboys and aliens. It's my fa favorite title <laughs> ever. Cowboys and aliens. But, but it's a I it's a remake. It. It's a second time round. I love it. Really, it's great. Uh, <laughs> it's... Yeah. Um, Have you seen it? Uh, yes. <laughs> you watched it to the end, or you kind of? Uh... I was, you know, I was sleeping a little bit. I was tired that day. <laughs> And then you wake up, and then they're still there, all these monsters and stuff. Yeah, wow. <clears throat> uh, what we're talking about? <laughs> we're talking about the, one of the greatest movies ever made. <laughs> well, um, maybe they offer me Cowboys and Aliens Part 2, you imagine? Maybe. Maybe it's a good experience. Um, uh, people will keep making films. And, and I think we, we are in a situation where as much as it's not just directors, I know it's an industry with uh, lighting and sound and, and post-production, lots of things, but pe I think we will find a way to keep movie making movies. That's my hope. And, but people need to, you know, very good uh, healthcare uh, and, and uh, mothers who are working need a place where they can take care of their kids, we need things. And if we make less movies, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. But is there a risk that the few, fewer movies will be made, not just that fewer will be made, but of lower quality, or at least of, you know, more of superhero and, um, you know, action-packed um, uh, Well, if you content. see the films who make more, you know, the, the latest box office are always like, Hero movies, superhero, superhero, more superhero. Comedy. Film space. I think this, this thing they do in, how you call that? Um, Comic-Con? What is it? And this, this, this big meeting with comic books, creators, yeah, the, like Comic-Con? With, yeah, with the Marvel. That, um, that was, the, I will forbid. Captain thing. America. Yeah. Because they, they, they kept together all these Star, Star Trek fans and and they, and then you know, people from marketing uh, departments of big companies, they go and they believe, you know, since since people are so passionate about uh, uh, all these four fantastics and all these things, yeah. I don't like superheroes, I have to say. No. No, I find them very boring. Batman, and it's, it's so fun. Like it's so dark. Dark, come on. Well, Any character of a Thomas Mann movie, uh, a movie uh, novel is dark. It's dark. Uh, Batman dark? What's the dark thing about it? Okay. That's well, I, I think basically, well, thank you. you. You're here to a lot of people here who probably want to ask you a few questions. So I'd like to open up the discussion. Uh, and anybody, anybody who has a question, please, uh, please go ahead. Any other questions? Uh, Anyone? They are hungry. Ooh. There's really a lot of hunger. I see hunger, hunger around, around the Niemeyer Center. OK, well, in that case, I think we'll, we'll, we'll close it and uh, say, oh, sorry, sorry, we have, we have one more question. Thank you very much. In the film of the map of the Sonidos of Tokyo, there is a scene in which, well, the scenes of sex, which I think were scenes of sex very feminine, o una sexualidad más mirada desde el punto de vista de una mujer. Quería preguntarte si, si tomaste la decisión conscientemente de hacerla así o salió por tu... Bueno, well, 
uh, this this question is very interesting because sometimes they ask you so what's the difference between um, uh, being a director as a woman and do you think there are like female films or or male films? Uh, you know, when when you're shooting, you're not you're not letting your gender uh, outside the set. So for me, it was very natural. I just did what what I wanted to see, and I think the things Rio wanted to feel and see and experiment, and it was not conscious, but but yeah, probably it was. And uh, and Sergi uh, Lopez was very happy. <laughs> <laughs> I can see why. Okay. Any any final final question? Okay. Well, then we'll uh, wrap up, and I'll say again, thank you very, very much, uh, Isabel, you, for, for giving us uh, a lot of your time and for sharing all your thoughts. Thank you. Gracias.